Well. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. Welcome back from your break, and welcome back to the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Uh, we are coming up on the keynote, and it is a highlight as well as a keynote of our conference today. It's my pleasure to be hosting a man who is genuinely a friend, but also someone I genuinely admire, Heizo Takanaka. Um, if, if this was Japan, and probably among the Japan specialists in this room, he's someone like Kissinger or Summers, you can say he needs no introduction. Um, Heizo is Senior Research Fellow at the Japan Center for Economic Research. He's professor and director of the Global Security Research Institute, KEO. But of course, this is only a part of what Heizo has represented for Japanese economic policy. In 2001, under the previous reform-minded Prime Minister Junichiro Koizumi, Heizo Takanaka became the Minister for Economic and Fiscal Policy, and he chaired the Council on Economic and Fiscal Policy and steered macro policy. And over the next five and a half years, and they were quite active five and a half years, uh, Professor Takanaka spearheaded Japan's economic reform. He was moved into the Minister for Financial Services as well in the next year, and we can date to then, finally, the ending of Japan's banking crisis. Uh, I had the privilege to be involved in some of the uh, discussions and analysis and the communications between Heizo and his then counterpart, Glenn Hubbard. Um, and I can just say that Heizo is someone who combines, as many people in this room do, but few of us can always succeed, um, the desire to do the right thing in economic policy, the desire to base it on good economic analysis, and the ability to carry it through. And Hazo has done that repeatedly. Um, he has a very distinguished academic career. Um, he started his academic career as a visiting scholar at both Harvard and University of Pennsylvania. Of course, his most important prior appointment was Heizo Takanaka was a visiting fellow here at the Institute for International Economics in 1989. And I commend Fred Bergston, who clearly has an eye for talent, me notwithstanding. Um, he knew enough to get Heizo in here, destined for future greatness, and so he has been. Um, Heizo is going to speak to us. I keep referring to him by his first name because he's known that way to all his friends, but the distinguished former minister, Professor Takanaka, will speak to us about assessing and where we are and where we're going to be on structural reform in Japan. This is not merely an academic exercise. As many of you know, Professor Takanaka is the most important outside advisor to the Abe government on issues of economic reform, and we're very grateful to be able to welcome him back. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for a nice introduction, Adam. And uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Heizo Takenaka. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be here. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, express my sincere gratitude to all people in IIE uh, whose effort made this conference possible and all other participants here taking time from your busy schedule. I'm very honored uh, to have an opportunity to make a presentation on uh, the economic policy of Japan and its implications. Uh, very fortunately, in the past two years or so, we have more opportunities uh, than before to discuss uh, Japan's economic policy in constructive manner uh, like this conference. However, very honestly, I feel a little bit uh, handicapped today because Fred Bergstein, Adam Posen, and other excellent American economists have very special talent to speak in a very exciting manner, even if the content is not so exciting. <laughs> Still, the Japanese economists like me have another special talent to speak very monotonously, even when the topic is interesting. So I am a little bit handicapped. As was mentioned by Adam, well, I had a very good experience as a visiting fellow 25 years ago here at the IIE. If my speech is good, this is owing to the training here in this IIE, 
if my speed is not so good, there is something wrong about the training system in PII. <laughs> well, oh, fortunately, uh, two years ago, uh, two, two years and three months ago, we had uh, a very special prime minister named Abe. And before that, 14 years ago, uh, we had another special uh, leader named Koizumi. I worked under him for nearly six years. He was a very unique and special prime minister. Koizumi was a very special, unique prime minister in the history of Japanese politics. How unique was he? He nominated me as a minister. How unique <laughs> he was. And also, he supported my policy for a long time. As you know, after the birth of the bubble economy in the late 80s, uh, the Japanese economy had been stagnant. But under Koizumi, Japan promoted some bold uh, economic reform like the disposal of non-performing loan uh, in the banking sector and the privatization of Japan Post, Japan Highway, and so on. And then Japanese economy once revitalized. But after Koizumi stepped down in the year 2006, the momentum of the reform explicitly declined. The economic performance of Japan again got worse. Uh, however, anyway, as I mentioned, two years, three months ago, we had a new prime minister again, Prime Minister Abe, and he started the new economic policy package, so-called Abenomics. Under Abenomics, I'd like to say, the Japanese economy has been changing distinctly. Uh, anyway, so I'd like to discuss first what happened in the Japanese economy and the contents of Abenomics. Also, I'll discuss what will happen to the Japanese economy from now. Uh, let me briefly review the recent trend of the Japanese economy. Before Prime Minister Abe took office, the Japanese economy was in the negative growth. The uh, growth rate in the second half of uh, 2012 was uh, uh, minus 2% or so. But in the fiscal year of 2013, the uh, first year of economics, the growth rate increased to positive 2%. Uh, this was a big change. As a result, the stock price in Japan increased by 57% in 2013. This was the highest increase among OECD countries. In that year, the US economy was also good, almost finishing the uh, adjustment of balance sheet of the household sector. Uh, so gross rate of the stock uh, price was 28% or so here in the United States. But Japan gross rate was 50 Seven percent, about double of that of the United States. Also, in labor market, a full employment employment was re realized. A job offer applicant ratio, which was once 0 0.4 after the Lehman shock, that increased to 1.1 recently, especially in the Tokyo area. This ratio, job offer applicant ratio, is higher than 1.6. Uh, at least in the first year of Abe administration, I can say that Abenomics was successful, or, or I'd like to say fully successful in the first year. However, in April last year, the consumption tax rate was increased from 5% to 8%. This took a heavy uh, toll, especially on the household spending, hitting the Japanese economy bigger than anticipated. The growth rate in the second quarter last year was minus 6%, annually, also in the third quarter, minus 2%. Uh, consequently, the growth rate uh, throughout the year uh, 2014 was almost 0%. Anyway, tax hike had led the Japanese economy to the negative growth for two consecutive quarters. Under such circumstances, uh, Prime Minister Abe decided to postpone another round of tax increase that was originally planned in October this year. An important point is that tax hike, this tax hike was decided by the former administration under DPJ uh, before the birth of Abe administration. Therefore, it has nothing uh, to do with Abenomics. I have been consistently against the tax hike because a uh, deflation mindset of the people had not completely disappeared. Under such circumstances, tax rates should not be raised. So I felt happy with the Prime Minister's decision and welcomed it. 
Prime Minister Abe also decided to ask the people whether the people support Prime Minister's idea or not. This was the reason why the diet was dissolved and the election was held in December last year. As you know, Prime Minister Abe won the landslide victory, obtaining two-thirds majority in the lower house of the Diet. It is quite rare in Japan that the ruling party get two-thirds of majority for two consecutive elections. The last year's election was the one to ask the population to vote for or vote against Abenomics or government economic policy. So now, Prime Minister Abe was given another four years to lead the nation stably, stably. So I'm, or we are now watching very carefully how, in what way, he will make use of his solid and stable political power and how to allocate his political capital in economic policy and diplomatic policy. And now then, what elements of Abenomics? Maybe you already understand the framework. Uh, are these moving ahead smoothly or not? As you know, Abenomics consists of three policies, or three allows. The other day, uh, Prime Minister Abe was asked, asked by one journalist, uh, how high or low the score of the current situation of Abenomics is? If, if Prime Minister himself grades. In usual case, I used to be in uh, the political field for five, six years or so. In this case, politicians are supposed to answer in the following way. Well, well, this kind of evaluation should be done by the people, not politicians, political leaders, uh, is to accept that in a sincere manner. So this is a very usual pattern of uh, politicians. However, Prime Minister is sometimes very frank. <laughs> And uh, he, at that time, answered very frankly, the current score is 67 out of 100. 67 out of 100. What do you think of this? I think this is a very reasonable judgment. Uh, maybe he, he, Prime Minister, tried to say that the first arrow, the monetary policy expansion, was well done, so this is OK. Uh, but the second allow, a flexible fiscal policy, and the third allow, a growth strategy, are only half of the story, or uh, stumbling a little bit along the way. So one plus 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5, <laughs> so two thirds, 67 out of 100. Uh, considering the time constraints, I have not discussed much about the first allow or monetary policy. Basically, Governor Kuroda of Bank of Japan is doing well, I think. Uh, last year, as I mentioned, uh, GDP growth rate was around 0% uh, because of tax hike. However, the Japanese stock price increased by 9%, which was almost equal to that of the United States. This is mostly because of the effort of the monetary policy, the Bank of Japan. From here on, Anyway, Abe administration is required two important policy efforts. One, one is uh, to draw a persuasive roadmap for fiscal consolidation. The second arrow has two parts. In the short run, fiscal expansion should be done, but in the midterm, fiscal consolidation is needed. So, uh, in this regard, the role of the Council on Economic and Fiscal Policy is very important. The Prime Minister uh, promised to clarify this roadmap for fiscal consolidation by the summer of this year, when he dissolved diet last year. In this process, the most important factor is not to ta not a tax hike, in my understanding, but a reform of uh, social security expenditures uh, that account for 30% of the total government expenditures. Another effort uh, required for Abe government is to strengthen its growth strategy, the third arrow growth strategy. This is exactly the most important and attention-grabbing task. Uh, I will discuss some details of Abe's growth strategy. 
Uh, in the morning session, I heard that uh, Mr. Kuahara discussed the importance of corporate governance. Of course, this is one of the most important issue because in the case of Japan, the uh, business opening ratio is quite low. At, it is about half of that of the, the United States. At the same time, business closing ratio is low, about half of that of the United States. The metabolism of the industry is low. Or in order to enhance the metabolism of the society, metab metabolism of the uh, industry, the, the role of the uh, COVID governance is very important, I think. But anyway, the total scheme of the uh, growth strategy. Maybe you know Professor Hamada of Yale University. Uh, he's a very famous professor, and he's now a mentor to Prime Minister. Uh, two years ago, he scored three alloys and concluded as follows. The first arrow, monetary expansion, is good, so graded A. The second, fiscal policy, half done, but half not yet, so uh, graded B. But the score of the third arrow, growth strategy, that's it, very bad, so score is, is E, A, B, E, Abe. <laughs> that's the conclusion of Professor Hamada. However, we should be a little bit careful. Uh, the kind of, the, this kind of comparison of three arrows is not, not very fair in my understanding. It is because the initiative of the growth strategy is uh, mid and long-term initiatives. Uh, whereas the first and second arrow are related to the demand side of the economy, mostly related to the demand side. Uh, on the contrary, uh, a package, uh, growth strategy is a package of the structural reforms. As this uh, is related mostly to the supply side of the economy. In this regard, we need some patience to evaluate, to evaluate the growth strategy. Uh, it was the beginning of uh, the year 2000 uh, that Schroeder administration in Germany implemented the labor market reform. And it was 10 years later that the reform have begun to generate generate a tangible results. Uh, in a similar way, the growth strategy takes time. Anyway, the reputation of the growth strategy was not very good, at least at the beginning of its stage. However, in my understanding, the situation had been changing a little bit. Last year, last summer, the second round of growth strategy was announced from the government. Uh, right after that, Economist magazine, London Economist, London Economist ran an article that highly appreciated the growth strategy of Prime Minister Abe. This article said that Abe is driving in the southern of thick nails, rather than three arrows, they are driving in the southern of thick nails to the Japanese economy and society. This article also said that Abe's policy, Abe's policy could be even compared to Meiji Restoration, which initiated the modernization of Japan 150 years ago. Very honestly speaking, this is exaggeration. I'm, even I think that way. Uh, but anyway, Economist Magazine appreciated uh, Abe's growth strategy. However, very interestingly, right after that, Financial Times published an article that criticized Abe's growth plan. This article said that the plan itself was not so bad. However, these plans cannot be fulfilled because of the political difficulties. What do you think of that? Actually, in the last election, election last year, many reformers were elected as diet members. It's a good news. At the same time, many politicians who are against the reform were also elected as diet members. It is true. So these two different views are suggesting that everything is dependent on the incoming leadership by Prime Minister Abe towards the reform. Now then, I'd like to discuss a little bit when some features, uh, some, no, no, some uh, notable policies to enhance Japan's growth potential, the contents of uh, or the third arrow. In January last year, Prime Minister Abe was invited to Davos meeting to deliver a keynote speech 
of the opening session. In the 44 or 45 year history of Davos meeting, this was the first time that Japan's Prime Minister was asked to deliver keynote address. Prime Minister Abe gave a very decisive speech before world economic leaders regarding how to realize the economic reform of Japan. We call this as Abe's Davos promise. Davos promise. He raised many points, but four important points we should notice. He, four promise. Four promises are important. One is deregulation. Well, deregulation is always uh, and anywhere, anytime. It's very difficult. You might be, and you might understand. It's because so-called vested interest group are against deregulation using their strong political power. Especially in Japan, uh, there exist so-called bedrock regulations. Bedrock regulations. Uh, a typical example of this bedrock regulation is that, do you know that, usual business corporations are prohibited to enter agricultural businesses in Japan. To be, to be accurate, these businesses are prohibited to own farmland. To, they can borrow farmland, they can, but they cannot uh, own the farmland. Another example is that there is a strong constraint regarding the height of, the height of building, even in the central part of Tokyo. Or this regulation in floor area ratio will be lifted soon in special economic zone. But anyway, we have this kind of uh, bedrock regulation. Also, if it is uh, very difficult for foreigners to get resident status still in Japan, and for your information, in the past 35, 36 years, no medical school was not established in Japan. The newest medical school in Japan was the one in Ryukyu University that established in 1979. New medical school was not approved to, be, to establish because of very strong objection of the Association of Medical Doctors. But anyway, Prime Minister said in Davos meeting, by using the framework of special economic zone, the government will make a breakthrough to all bedrock regulations in two years. It's a very strong message. Uh, special economic zone, we, uh, I personally proposed in the policy board uh, to establish this uh, special economic zone, and Prime Minister Abe employed that. Uh, now, uh, last year, six areas already designated as a special economic zone. I'd like to discuss uh, later on a little bit uh, in the panel discussion with uh, Adam. The second promise was the uh, corporate tax cut. Japan's corporate tax rate, effective rate, is about 35%. That is as high as that of the United States. In the case of uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, it is 17%. Uh, Korea, 25%. England, 24%. Prime Minister Cameron promised in the same Davos meeting to cut the British corporate tax rate from 24% to 20%. But well, anyway, Abe promised. Then the government so far decided to reduce the to from 35 to 31 or 32 percent. This is a very small, small reduction. But anyway, this kind of process has started. This is a second promise. The third promise was, uh, uh, it is, he said, it is very important to, to make use of female labor and that the situation that the total population is declining and the demography is aging. In order to realize an increase of labor participation ratio of female, foreign labor will play an important role to support housework and elderly care. He explicitly said Japan will accept foreign labor. Very interestingly, still, according to the public opinion survey, uh, more than 90% of the Japanese people are against to accept immigration. So Prime Minister Abe said, oh, this is not immigration. This is guest workers. This guest worker. But anyway, in some special economic zone, we'll uh, accept some foreign laborers to support housework or elderly care. And the fourth promise, this is also very important from the viewpoint of foreign investors, that must be the reform of the uh, government pension investment fund. The Japanese government has a huge amount of pension fund. Uh, it reaches 
120 trillion yen or more than, uh, sorry, 100, 1 trillion US dollar. 1 trillion US dollar. This is uh, obviously the, maybe the largest fund in the world. However, the investment portfolio of this money is very rigidly regulated in Japan. About 60% of this money was automatically invested in JGB. And the, the portfolio, a share of, of investment to uh, stock market was limited to only 12%. This 12% will be increased to 25% from this year. This will have a very positive impact to stimulate the market, I think. Anyway, so, so this year, 2015, is a very important year as a uh, touchstone of new stage of economics. I believe so. Uh, here, I uh, would like to mention a little bit, a, a little bit naive topic. This is a naive topic. I think there are some bureaucrats, Japanese bureaucrats from Minister of Finance or METI, etc. But uh, this is about Abe style, Abe style of policy making. Well, in my understanding, the Abe government is very much dependent of METI, Minister of Economy, Trade, and Industry, rather than MOF, M O F. In for a long time, MOF bureaucrat had been influencing a lot to the pa past government, but Abe is a little bit different. He made use of the power of med bureaucrat of METI. Uh, this is uh, reflected in the allocation, personnel allocation of the prime minister's office. So the staff, uh, the assistant uh, secretary, the prime ministers, uh, most of them are uh, former or working METI bureaucrat not MOF bureaucrat. And this must be a little bit uh, connected with the fact that his father, his father was a minister of METI and not minister of MOF. And he had a rival at the time, political rival, Mr. Takeshita and Mr. Miyazawa. Uh, these were most of, uh, both of them were minister of finance. Uh, this is not my opinion. This is the opinion by some journalists maybe. But anyway, uh, more importantly, Prime Minister Abe's economic policy or idea sometimes conflict with the MOF idea. MOF tends to focus mostly tax hike for fiscal consolidation. Uh, some, uh, but Mr. Abe also understands the importance of fiscal consolidation, but he wants to improve macroeconomic environment first. And he believes this will also contribute a lot to fiscal rehabilitation. I, 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 of course, personally support Prime Minister's idea. Anyway, uh, Prime Minister Abe is uh, dependent of METI rather than MOF. However, from here on, Abe administration will need more cooperation with MOF bureaucrat than before for realizing the fiscal consolidation. The, uh, th th this is a very important point for, uh, the, for, uh, for other presentation from now. Well, anyway, I'd like to mention one thing, that is the population issue, or uh, demographic issue. Well, the total population started declining uh, around uh, 2005, so in the past 10 years or so, the Japanese population didn't increase and declined a little bit. We sometimes use population bonus and the population onus. Well, under the situation, the population is increasing. We have some merits. It is relatively easy to activate the economy, but under the situation when the, the population is declining, sometimes it's difficult. We have some difficulties. For example, the burden on fiscal burden, especially social insurance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, uh, now in the, we are in the process of population onus. Pa in the past, we had a population bonus. And very interestingly, all neighboring countries will quite soon go into the stage of population onus, including China, Korea, Hong Kong, etc., etc. So it is very important for all Asian countries to run each other best practices 
And in that sense, uh, Japan policy uh, must be very important uh, while well, uh, showing some good example. Good example, bad, bad example, we have many, but it is very important to have a very uh, solid attitude to have a good discussion with neighboring countries regarding this population related issues. Anyway, uh, as I mentioned, the Japanese economy is changing a lot under economics. Uh, finally, I, I'd like to mention one important factor. That is the, the Olympic game, which will be held in the year 2020. Uh, this will provide a further chance for the development of the Japanese economy. Just 51 years ago, we hosted the former Olympic game in Tokyo. Uh, at that time, I was a uh, uh, middle middle school student living in the local area, so I couldn't understand what happened in, uh, at that time. But, but it is quite true that I found that the framework of the current Japan, the framework of current Tokyo was, was created at that time. For example, maybe you know that we have very special uh, rapid train system, Shinkansen system. Shinkansen was opened only nine days before the Olympic game, nine days before the Olympic game. And there are some you know, uh, established hotels in Tokyo, New Otani, uh, Tokyo Prince Hotel, Capital Tokyo Hotel. These hotels were opened in the year of Olympic game. And another famous hotel, Hotel Okura. Okura was opened two years before the Olympic game. Also, we have some good examples of the business development, or economic development, business uh, industrial development. Well, at that time, we, some pe people saw that, well, we are going to receive, accept many VIPs from foreign countries. This is the for, maybe for the first time after the, the end of the Second World War, VIP. So security business could be very, very important, promising. And one company was established two years before the Olympic game. It was uh, Nihon KB Hosho. The current name is Secom. Secom is the largest security company in Japan. But at the very beginning, when it was established two years before the Olympic game, the number of workers were only two. There were only two workers, very small company. But now the security business has been developing a lot and uh, at this moment, 503, sorry, 500,000 people are now working in this security business. From two to 500,000, this industry developed. The Olympic game started this kind of opportunity. So taking this opportunity of hosting Olympic game, it is very important for Japan to promote bold economic reform comprehensively. Uh, now in the Asia, in Asia, there are there exist about uh, five hundred uh, million middle income people. The population of middle income people five hundred million. But it is estimated to become three point five times in the coming five, six years or so. And maybe they will have another more chance to come to Japan, visit Japan, have a business, Japan making use of or LCC, et cetera, et cetera. So this will provide a very good chance uh, uh, for the development of the uh, Japanese economy. Well, uh, anyway, as was mentioned by Adam, uh, time flies uh, like an arrow. I came here for the first time 25 years ago, but many things have changed. Time flies like an arrow. It is a very important message. So my hope is three arrows will fly like time. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate your comments. Thank you very much for giving us a training course in how to give a speech. Um, we know you are in infinite demand and have to leave at 1.30.
sharp. So let me start right in, and then we'll turn to our distinguished audience. I must admit, as wonderful as your speech was, as much as I back it, I was quite shocked and disappointed that you made no mention of agricultural reform and Trans-Pacific Partnership. Oh. And uh, given that Prime Minister Abe is supposed to be making a visit here uh, in a few weeks, and that the primary objective from the U.S. government side of that visit is to have concluded the bilateral aspect of the U.S.-Japan negotiations over TPP as then the domino for the rest of it. Uh, I'm quite shocked. And moreover, just to put the point a little more forcefully, I was there for the thrilling speech in Davos by uh, Prime Minister Abe in January 2013, excuse me, 2014. Yeah. Uh, it was terrific, but part of his being the drill bit of reform was explicitly to take on agriculture and to promote TPP as well as promoting inward investment in Japan, something we talked about this morning. So I'm going to give you a chance to make good. <laughs> Explain to me why that wasn't important or why that was an oversight. Well, Adam, you always raise a very stimulating question and a very important question. I appreciate that. Well, TPP, I, uh, because of time constraints, I didn't talk much about the agricultural reform. Uh, but uh, uh, it's a very good chance for me to uh, speak what's happening in Japan in this field, the, the reform of this field. Have you ever heard the term Zenchu? Zenchu, Zenchu is a national union of uh, agricultural cooperatives. Average national age union 82. Yeah. <laughs> national union of agricultural cooperatives. This had keeping very strong political power uh, to be against the TPP. And uh, this is, uh, in a sense, a symbol of very obsolete agricultural system of Japan. And Prime Minister Abe boldly decided to abolish the auto power of Zenchu. This is a very big political fight, I think. Please imagine that the US president is fighting against the National Rifle Association. Yes. And uh, in that sense, uh, well, the, the, the our atmosphere on, our TB, uh, on uh, TBP, especially in the field of agriculture, will change dramatically. But still, still this is not enough, I agree. Uh, but uh, Prime Minister Abe still said that it's a, uh, TBP is an important pillar of economics, and uh, he uh, is ready to fight against this kind of polit political uh, power. And he, actually, this is advancing. Well, this is the political negotiation issue, so I'm not sure what kind of negotiation is now done. Uh, but I am, I am relatively optimistic about the process of TPP uh, because both the United States and Japan are beneficiaries of this TPP. So, so it will take some time to make an arrangement, the political arrangement, but well, this is advancing, and from, especially from the Japan side, the power of Zenchu will be de decreased dramatically from now. Oh, it, it will become, in that sense, become easier for that. My, may I raise one question? What will happen to the US side? Mm -hmm. Many Japanese policymakers are worrying about the state situation of the US government. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the conflict between the president and the Congress, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, so I, I think I am, I said, as I said, I'm optimistic about negotiations. Especially, I'm optimistic to the decision making of the Japanese government, but I'm not very sure about what will happen to the US side. Well, uh, speaking frankly, <laughs> um, the divisions within the US government are not good news for the US or for the world economy. Hmm. But the one issue on which the US government, Congress, and the Obama administration have hopes of getting bipartisan agreement in the next six months or a year is on TPA and TPP. And we've seen quite a lot of bipartisan outreach. And there are clearly people in the Democratic Party, but an increasing number of people in the Republican Party in the House who are skeptical. And there are many issues on the table. But the, as we're going to be discussing it following your remarks in this session, both the national security arguments and the bottom line economic arguments remain compelling. And there is a cross the aisle, very large group of 
legislators and very strong backing by the president. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, we went through this dance a while ago when President Obama went to Tokyo and there was supposed to be a deal and Prime Minister Abe didn't quite do the deal and now we're hearing it again. I think the, the only way we get forward is a U.S.-Japan agreement, which then leads to enough on the table from everyone else in TPP to make it worth approval. Uh, but I am convinced that this administration is taking this issue much seriously, much more seriously, and putting more political weight on it than they have any other international economic issue to date. Now, that's not, you'll notice, the most ringing endorsement of their international economic policy to date. <laughs> But uh, on this issue, I feel comfortable. Okay. Others in this audience can obviously disagree or agree. Hazel, let me ask you another question. You made reference to this in your remarks. Um, a year, a year and a half ago, um, you know, I come to Japan, I get to hear you talk. You were very influentially pushing this idea of special economic zones. And there again, it was something that echoed with various American reform efforts, things we're seeing in Europe. And at the time you were pushing them, it sounded to me in reading your remarks and others in the debate, it sounded very promising. It was about really, like you said, with medical schools. It was about liberalizing zoning and labor laws in Osaka and Tokyo and major urban centers and really pushing things forward in the services sector. Over the last year, it seems like some think tank that wasn't us managed to have a big influence by publishing a report saying, all these towns in the rest of Japan are going to shut down in the next 20 years because <laughs> there's no population growth. And then suddenly all these people in the diet said, let's call Okawakanufi Townlet on Hokkaido a special economic zone and send money there. Am I being overly cynical? Has the special economic zones process been hijacked by old LDP pork barrel politics? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, January this year, we had a discussion, panel discussion in the Davos meeting. And uh, at that time, I remember you gave this kind of uh, serious criticism. And I didn't have a chance to respond to that at that time, <laughs> so let me respond. Well, first of all, the new special economic zone is very much different from the past special economic zone. Well, the current economic zone, new economic zone is like that. Well, uh, assume the Tokyo area. Well, the so-called regional conference, regional conference, the special conference is established. And uh, in this regional conference, the minister of special economic zone will attend, representing the central government. And the governor of mayor will re attend, representing regional government. And uh, some will representing the public sector joining them. So from the central government, from the regional government, from the private sector. This is a regional conference. This can play just like the miniature government. They can decide everything by them. So this is quite unique administrative system in the history of Japanese politics. And so, so still, still, in my impression, the mayors and the governors are still a little bit reluctant, uh, reluctant to promote the reform. But in this case, Prime Minister and the uh, Minister of Special Economic Zone are urging them. And in this case, the deregulation will advance in a little bit different way compared with the past Special Economic Zone. And there is a very famous uh, example, very small city, Yabu City of Yabu, Yabu City in Hyogo Prefecture. This is a small city. But this mayor is very eager to change the agricultural system. And, and th this is now providing a very good opportunity for all business, other businesses to invest in this agriculture. This is changing. So looking at this, uh, what's happening in Yabu City, some other cities are now uh, raising hand to become special economic zone. So it has just started, only 10 months or so still, but it's moving, I think. And uh, uh, yes, another important uh, example is uh, medical school. Mm -hmm. Well, medical school will be established. But in the Tokyo Special Economic Zone term, this is some area of Tokyo and Kanagawa Prefecture at the area. But additionally, we put Narita City in Chiba Prefecture. That isn't quite simple. The one university is planning to establish a medical school here near Narita Airport. This is the beginning, maybe, of also the medical tourism. Also. 
Well, still, still medical associations are against that, but I'm very confident that the new medical school will be approved. Yeah. So, but I, I, I'm also frustrated a little bit about the slowness of that. Uh, but this special common system is advancing. And the second point, second point, this is a, a declining trend and some, uh, according to one estimate, there are 1,800 town and cities in Japan, and among them, 800 will disappear by the year two, two, 2040 because of the decline of the population. This is one estimate. And uh, some, yes, some, some LGP members are demanding uh, to give money, etc., etc. but prime ministers are completely against that. And uh, at this moment, well, uh, the, this kind of fiscal support will not be done, will not be done by, by the government. So deregulation is the central pillar, central uh, vehicle of uh, uh, structural reform. And so, so uh, of course, we need more effort at this moment. But, but anyway, uh, this special economic zone way, uh, system is, uh, you know, progressing slowly but steadily. This is my understanding. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you've covered so much and you've done it so well. And I, I also want to be clear that we're not back, certainly at least in this building, we're not back to the 90s about, you know, Japan's got all these problems and there's nothing in the U.S. Your analogy to the NRA is apt. We have our own problems getting the medical industry and other services industries to allow international competition here. So, so it's great to hear you making strides on that. I would, however, like to ask you to sort of put on one of your other hats. I mean, you're, you do so much work with and in China. You do so much work in, this, in the sort of economic security sphere. I'd like you to, to say a little bit about how you see Avenomics progressing in terms of where that puts us in sort of the triangle of US, China, Japan. I mean, we've seen here, and Fred Bergsten gave an excellent op-ed that I agreed with recently about the U.S. should be playing from the day one in the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. And now we've heard, I believe, that even the government of Japan has now said that they're prepared to join, uh, which was a bit of a surprise. I mean, do we view, should Beijing view Abenomics as pushing Japan in a more strong confrontational perspective versus China? Or is this something that complements and deepens integration with China? How should the U.S. view Abenomics in terms of what we think should be happening with economic governance? Well, uh, this is a very uh, complicated issue, but an important You're issue. You're the man. You're the man. <laughs> well, uh, first of all, it is very important for Japan to strengthen our economy for Japanese, but this will also help to all Asian economy, as I mentioned. Uh, still, the influence of Japanese economic development is very big. Uh, uh, this is the first point. And uh, Prime Minister Abe is often regarded as a, a kind of a hawkish politician or rightist, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But my observation is a little bit different. He's a realist. He's a realist, actually. Uh, so he also pays special much attention to the relationship with China. But as for AIIB, the, the, the Japanese government at the very beginning stage has been watching very carefully the decision making of the United States. At that time, in my observation, uh, the US government, President Obama, persuaded European countries and other Asian countries, Australia, not to join AIIB. So, so Japanese government watched very carefully uh, the, the movement of the U.S. and uh, the government and decided his position. But uh, our expectation was uh, a little bit betrayed. All, almost influential European countries decided to join. Uh, so under such circumstances, very recently, uh, Minister of Finance, Mr. Aso, changed his word a little bit. Oh, still, still we have not decided yet. Uh, well, if the, the governance of the, uh, this new bank is so uh, good, in this case, we uh, should was considering joining, et cetera, et cetera. So in this sense, Japan has, Japan has a very strong influence on Asian Development Bank. Right. The governor of Asian Development Bank uh, had been always Japanese, from most of the Ministry of Finance. In that sense, in that sense, 
uh, still Japanese government have a tendency to uh, place more importance on the role of Asian Development Bank. Uh, still, still uh, they are not, not, not so much reluctant to join that. But still, still my point is, uh, uh, as for AIIB, uh, Jap Japanese government is watching carefully uh, the making of uh, uh, the, the U.S. government. But Fred Buxton and your influence is uh, great. So uh, after going back to Japan, I'll ask Prime Minister and other staff members to watch very carefully Fred and Adam. <laughs> well, we, we, I will take a little credit that along with Fred, we've been the only ones out there in public saying this. Um, but anyway, you've been much too gracious and very accommodating. We have many distinguished guests and friends with us today. I'd like to open the floor to questions. As usual, I'd like to ask that the first couple questions go to our outside guests, not to Peterson Institute fellows. Uh, Jessica is here with a microphone up front. There's a standing mic at back. Uh, please raise your hand if you wish to be recognized. Yeah, right there. If you could identify yourself, sure. please. Sure, Tobias Harris from Teneo Intelligence. Um, I just want to go back to when you were talking about Abe's style of leadership, because I think there's something very important there. It tells you how he uses his political capital, what his priorities are. You obviously worked, you were very closely, worked closely with the prime minister who had a very different style of leadership, much more confrontational, much more taking these interests head on. Um, and I just wonder if you could talk about some of the differences, what you think might actually work more. I mean, we've seen Abe, um, you know, he was, he was willing to, co to compromise a little bit with Jay Zenshu, right? He, found, he got something less than what the government, I think, had wanted initially, while still kind of moving things forward. And I just wonder if you could talk what you think might be more effective. Would you like to see Abe more confrontational like Koizumi? Would you like to, I mean, what, what do you think can work more over the long term? Well, uh, after the establishment of Abe government, he first focused uh, to strengthen the uh, the monetary policy. Uh, then uh, he established a new policy board named the Council on Industrial Competitiveness to discuss the growth strategy, etc., etc. And also uh, he established a new policy board to discuss educational reform, etc., etc. But still, some, some, in some area, uh, Abe kept silent. Well, even in the case of Prime Minister, uh, what can be uh, done by Prime Minister is limited. limited. Uh, so he has some priorities in, first of all, the monetary policy, then the growth strategy, et cetera, et cetera. The, the remaining problem, especially in the field of economic policy, is, uh, for example, as I mentioned in my speech, the most important one is the reform of social, ref social security. Social security, well, uh, that uh, accounts for about 30% of the total expenditure of the government. And uh, also, the demography is aging. So from now on, social expenditures, pension expenditures, and the medical care expenditures will explode almost every year. So we need a very fundamental, fundamental comprehensive reform needed for social welfare system. Uh, but still, still uh, the, there is some policy board to reform that. But they, uh, it had been succeeded from the former government there's no new invention from the, uh, the uh, government from uh, under uh, the leadership of uh, Prime Minister Abe. This is the first one. Another one is energy policy, maybe. As I mentioned, this government is very much influenced by Meti bureaucrat. And Meti had been in charge of uh, energy policy for a long time. So the current energy policy, that Meti is responsible for the current energy situation. In that sense, even maybe, maybe from a viewpoint of Prime Minister, uh, uh, he's at this moment a little bit reluctant to uh, have a uh, global reform. But anyway, we have very serious problem about the nuclear power plant issue. And uh, also at this moment, well, the energy price had been declining. So in the short run, uh, we have uh, the better opportunity. But anyway, anyway, in the long run, uh, what kind of energy strategy we should have? even considering obtaining the energy, enough energy, and at the same time reducing, uh, the, uh, reducing the pollution, et cetera, et cetera. So these two uh, policy efforts should be added in the new stage of economics. Terrific. 
Next question or comment? I'll let the IIE hounds out if no one else speaks. Okay, Arthur. Thank you. Arthur Alexander from Georgetown. Uh, you spoke about uh, that you were opposed to the consumption tax hike, but you also are saying that fiscal consolidation is a very necessary uh, new policy or new, new direction, perhaps working through Social Security reform, but uh, are you looking at other other policies uh, for fiscal consolidation? Uh, we're reducing corporate taxes, don't want to raise the consumption tax again. What, what's left? Where else can we go? Okay, thank you very much for raising a very important question. Well, uh, first of all, uh, uh, as I mentioned, the government is going to publish the roadmap for fiscal consolidation by the summer of this year. I have some personal recommendations. Well, uh, in, under Koizumi administration, uh, between year 2003-2007, we could reduce the primary deficit from 6% of GDP to 1% of GDP. So if that, that policy were to be continued for one or two more years, Japan could, could be the surplus, but primary surplus country. At that time, we didn't have any tax increase, but we placed a cap on expenditures. The, the expenditures GDP, GDP ratio should be constant. This placed a cap on expenditures. Under such circumstances, we stimulated the economy through the disposal of non-performing loan and the privatization of Japan Post. This is the main scenario for fiscal consolidation. Additionally, you are asking there are some additional scheme or not. Yes, there are some, I think. Well, in Japan, well, tax seeds are gathered by national tax agency. And the social security tax is gathered by, uh, what is, what's the name of that, anyway, Social Security uh, tax Agency or something like that. But this should be integrated. In the case of national tax agency, they have a very uh, uh, excellent skill together. It's a long history. But in the case of the uh, Social Security Office, well, they have some problems. This should be integrated. By doing that, uh, more revenue in total government to revenue, total revenue will be increased dramatically. According to one estimate uh, by one uh, influential politician, uh, Mr. Asao, uh, he raised a question in the diet. If this is integrated uh, just like the uh, internal revenue service or like that, in this case, total revenue of the uh, government will be increased by 10 trillion yen. This is almost equal to the total amount of the corporate tax payment well, I, I'm not sure this uh, uh, calculation is accurate or not, but anyway, uh, it, is, uh, it is recommended to have an well, internal revenue service like organization. This is, uh, uh, the, I think, the most important one. Another recommendation is the government still owns a huge amount of asset. This should be sold out. And now, so-called concession process has started. Concession means, please consider the case of airport. Airport is owned, held by the government, but the right to operate this operation would be right to be sold to the private sector. In the case of Japan, Sendai Airport is now under concession. And quite soon, Kansai, Kup, Kansai Airport, uh, this is a huge amount of concession. This will also start. Uh, this is, in a sense, the uh, recycling, recycling of the uh, infrastructure, in, uh, capital. This will also play a very important role, especially the regional government. We, we discussed a little bit the regional uh, economy declining. Yeah. But regional government owns a huge amount of assets. They can sell that. Uh, so th these two uh, are strongly recommended uh, to realize the uh, fiscal rehabilitation, to fiscal consolidation. Besides the very orthodox way to stimulate the economy. Fred. Uh, Fred Bergston from the Institute. Hazel, great to see you. Thanks for coming back. Uh, let me ask you a more fundamental question about fiscal consolidation. Why do you care? Okay. 
Japan has, as is well known, Japan has by far the highest debt to GDP ratio of any country in the OECD, mm -hmm. much higher than Greece, but it doesn't seem to have caused you any problems. You yourself oppose a second stage of the tax increase, mm -hmm. rightly, I would say, totally with you on that. But why do you worry? Demonstrably, this huge level and buildup of debt has not had adverse effects on the Japanese economy. Is that a wrong assessment? And if it's not, why do you worry? Okay. Let, me, let me give you 10 seconds more before you respond to that. Um, a slightly less provocative version of that statement would be our colleague Joe Gagnon, who's argued that there's a very big distinction to be made between economies where you can print your own currency and economies where you can't. And that Japan, of course, has huge domestic savings on its own currency. And so even if maybe Greece shouldn't take a lesson from Japan, Japan may have certain degrees of freedom that Greece doesn't. Anyway, that's what just supposed to give you more time before you decide. <laughs> Thank you for your consideration, Adam. <laughs> if I say my answer in one word, that is a sustainability problem. Sustainability problem. If the situation is not sustainable, in my understanding, why does you mention G, uh, JGB, government bond, GDP ratio is exceeding 200% in Japan, uh, which is higher than Greece, and, but still this is financed. But still, still this is increasing. JGB, government bond, GDP ratio is exploding. So we cannot continue this situation. We can explain a little bit in a different way. For example, well, you say that uh, the Japan is a country of high savings. But maybe you, you know that last year, the household saving rate of Japan became negative, reflecting the demography, demographic change, aging of the society. The deficit of the government means the negative saving in the public sector. But this negative saving had been financed by the high positive saving of the private sector. But private sector saving, or to be specific, uh, household saving rate is now becoming negative. Still, corporate sector has some savings, right. uh, but uh, so the, the situation is not sustainable considering the demographic change. Of course, we should consider another important fact. Uh, the Ministry of Finance and the government always say the gross debt. But if you consider the net debt, net debt is not so big at this moment in Japan. Uh, so still, we have some room, some time to improve the situation. But still, I'd like to say, that finally, the situation is not sustainable. We cannot continue this situation for <coughs> longer time. So we need, we need time, some uh, time for preparation. This is the reason, reason why we should start a very serious discussion on the roadmap of fiscal consolidation. You are not persuaded yet? Yeah, no, Fred, <laughs> it's fascinating. Fred's always worried about our trade deficits, but he's never worried about Japan's. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, let me follow up on that just briefly, Hazo, because you, well, no, but they are linked, Fred. That's the point. Um, the, 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 you know, you and I actually were together, I mean, not that my opinion matters like yours, but you and I were together in terms of fiscal and monetary policy in the late 90s, early 2000s. This last fall, I was on the other side. I wanted to see the tax hike go through. Mm. And it was because of the sustainability argument that, you know, putting it crudely, one way of looking at sustainability, and this is where the trade deficit comes in, is yes, of course, as, as Charles Horioka predicted two decades ago, right? Japan's demographics mean household savings is going down. Japan starts running a trade deficit. We've seen that. And, you know, depending on how you calculate, you have roughly 10 to 12 years of continued trade deficits before you run out of accumulated net foreign assets. And so that, in a sense, could be your sustainability constraint. And so the question is, since you're, I know you're not stipulating specifically that, but you know, you, you're, I know you recognize that issue. Why would you not want to say, okay, given the bad choices, we're gonna have to consolidate at some point. Why wouldn't we want to spread it out over more years and start now versus, as you say, waiting and preparing and having to do it later. I mean, that's just the question. I mean, well, the question is, though, why? why? Why did you choose to postpone and therefore presumably have to do the same consolidation in a shorter span of time 
rather than advocating starting it early? Well, everything is dependent on the expectation of the market. Well, uh, of course, it is very difficult to predict what kind of pre uh, expectation is held by the, uh, by, uh, by, by the market people. Uh, but it is, it is uh, the government should avoid some kind of risk, uh, considering the expectation changed too uh, dramatically. The once expectation ch changed, it is very difficult to correct that. Uh, so it is uh, safe. It must be safe for the government at this moment to provide the very persuasive scenario or roadmap for the fiscal consolidation. And uh, this is my basic idea. And also, we can uh, say in the following way, well, now household saving, they, they did not a flow, flow concept. This is a stock concept. Now, household sector in Japan uh, is carrying uh, 1,400 trillion yen of asset, right? And now the debt is, uh, government debt is uh, one, roughly 1,000 trillion. Net or gross? That, that's gross, gross, gross concept. So the, 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 this gap is 400 trillion yen. And uh, every year, uh, the government is issuing bond about 40 trillion yen. So assuming it's a very simple calculation, this kind of thing will continue nearly 10 years. Well, so five to 10 years, but that's it. Yep. So this is a reason why uh, the government should make some preparations for fiscal rehabilitation. Uh, I'm afraid you are not persuaded yet. <laughs> I, I, I am though. Um, we're where you have a hard stop at 1.30, so for the last question, I'll turn to Jacob. Well, in the interest, Jacob Kicker got from the Peterson Institute. So, in the, in the interest of, of time, I'll just have I have a one word question: immigration. Okay. Is that part of Abenomics? Should it be? And what are the prospects and scale thereof? Okay. At this moment, at this moment, immigration, accepting immigration, is not a part of Abenomics. As I mentioned in my speech, Prime Minister himself sort of used the term: "This is not immigration." Uh, this is uh, accepting the guest workers. However, however, uh, there is a very interesting opinion in our society. Well, right after the Second World War, the total population, uh, Korean population living in Japan, is, was exceeding the Korean population in Seoul. Can you believe that? The Seoul was at that time one million population city, one million. And 20% was Japanese and 80% were Korean. But at that time in Japan, uh, more than 800,000 Korean people were there. It depends on the definition, of course. So, for example, there, is, there was a very famous uh, professional wrestler in Japan, Riki Dozan. He was from Korea. And there is a very famous baseball player, home run king, Sadaharu Oh. His father was from Taiwan. And many singers, many comedians, uh, mostly from uh, have of Korea, China, or Taiwan origin. So Japan is not so homogeneous country. Japan has been accepting Chinese, Koreans, Taiwanese, and we have been creating, creating the current pop culture. So it, th this kind of opinion should be shared by the people. If if we this kind of opinion is shared by the people the people attitude will change. But at this moment, as I mentioned, according to the public opinion poll, not more than 90% of the Japanese are against immigration. It will take more time. Thank you very much. Minister, you continue to lead intellectually as well as politically. We're very grateful that you came back here to share that with us. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.